they uh, act in a similar way as they were built in similar times. Um, we've seen New York. This is um, Rome. Um, not every city is so easy to describe through its types. Some are easier, some are more difficult. Rome is extremely easy, I would say, as there are basically two types. One is the Palazzina. Well, Rome was, um, was very small until the 19th century and it became the capital of Italy in the, in the 1870s, 71 or so. And then it grew enormously. So 90% of what Rome is today is built end of the 19th century and the 20th century. And it basically consists of um, two types. One is the Palazzina. It's a kind of Palazzina, it's, it's not the Palazzo. Eh? It is kind of the bourgeois version of the Palazzo. It's a bit, it has different parties. It's a bit more economical. It still wants to be representative. That's why architects were a bit critical about this type. Eh? It's individual, individual houses, six stories high, one staircase only five meters distance to the, to the, to the plot uh, limit. So um, a simple set of rules, and it was built, I don't know how many thousand times in, in, um, in, in Rome. And we collected them, and of course what we collected is, um, is examples that we found interesting when architects managed to deal with the constraints of this type and to give them a specific uh, architectural form. For instance, this one which is extremely um, oriented to one side. You can see it in the side plan, maybe. <laughs> this is the, 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 the built neighborhood and there's an open park. So to the open park, this building belongs. Yeah. This balcony is in, extreme, in a nearly uh, industrial way, extremely cool. Huge balconies, huge windows. And then there's kind of the backpack with um, secondary spaces, the kitchens and, and bedrooms and so on. So the, the order of this type how it is organized makes the expression of the building. Of course, the windows, how the windows are proportioned, how the balconies are done. Um, these are design, design decisions, um, but uh, they always interfere with the basic type, how it is organized, and the strength of architecture at the end lies in, um, in, in the clear clarity of the type. Palazzina is one type, the other types are these courtyards in different shapes. From 19th century, 1930s, end of 19th century too, or maybe around uh, the change of the, uh, um, of, the, uh, of the turn of the century. And you see this enormous richness which um, is possible by applying the regulations that were, uh, um, that were prescribing uh, how to build in certain areas of the city. In some, the Palazzinas, in others, these huge courtyard buildings. And of course, at the end, when we know the rules, then we can understand these situations. And we can also understand why these flower pots are here. Because it's an individual understanding an individual development of each plot, and this space is a space that should kind of provide a certain privacy to the house, and there is no idea behind this space. It's not a street, it's kind of just a distance to the plot. And um, this is one of the courtyards, early one, 19th century, where the courtyard is basically just providing air and, uh, and light to, to, the, to the rooms. Of course, there's a bit of greenery, but then this courtyard develops. So in the 1920s, under Mussolini, they, these buildings, they start to uh, create inner courtyards, which are kind of street-like, which um, have a public, a, a public character, yes, you can walk through, it's open. So um, they use the potential of this courtyard as a as a, as a public space. And then again, it changes in the 1950s when these courtyards um, try to um, realize the ideal of the green city, you know, Corbusier with, uh, um, with the 
with the open uh, green city with, with objects set in it and, and the nature going through. So you can see that, um, that uh, uh, ideas are changing over the generations and they have um, a very strong impact how these basic uh, types are then uh, set into reality. So this is a, um, a selection of, of types that show the variety of, um, of it. And, and at the end, you can see the Palazzinas and you can see areas where um, these bigger courtyard types were realized. At the end, these regulations, they explain us why Rome looks the way Rome looks. Huh? Of course, the monuments are important as identifying objects, but at the end, in, in this neighborhood, if you would just be brought there in a black box you now and sat in the street, you would immediately know you're in Rome you know? because um, the set of, uh, of rules and also of not necessarily only the regulations and the economy, but also, of course, um, cultural uh, um, conventions, how using, uh, how using balconies or how using the street is, are also um, relevant for how, how these, uh, these types are built. So um, that's how, why it is so important how these buildings work because they define the city and they build the city and, and uh, as I said in the beginning, I think this is what we have to achieve with our architecture that um, when we build a building, we always uh, also are partly building a city. And of course with this question we come to the Plissi. I call it Plissi typology. I don't show you the Plissi typology. This is the question mark. <laughs> what is it? These are first findings that I put quickly in this PowerPoint. Maybe you know it. Um, on the other side of the river, this 1950s building, this is the backyard. We could enter in an apartment with, with our students. Um, and of course, we try to understand what are the rules behind? Why does it look like this? Because I find this staircase extremely beautiful. It is very generous. It creates a space. Obviously, people are using it. How does this quality, how is this quality born? It's not the architect only who has the idea of creating such a staircase, it must have an, eco an economical logic, otherwise you wouldn't, you wouldn't build it. But it's a beautiful facade. I think in Tbilisi there are beautiful back facades. We always tried to go to the front and to the back of the house eh, and understand this relationship. I think this is an extremely interesting thing. Uh, another example that you know, um, this uh, caravanserai, um, opposite the, the, the museum, the historic museum, um, which we found, which is extremely interesting as it is so in introverted. No? One of the outside facades is basically a closed brick facade. It's so beautiful. No? Um, how, um, and it is based on a very uh, simple scheme of these balconies, now closed, giving access to all the rooms. So the whole expression of this building this beautiful courtyard, um, the depth of the facade, thanks to this, um, to, this, uh, to this balcony layer, are all typological decisions. Um, and this is my favorite, I don't know if you know it. It's behind this Zertelis uh, facade, the, the, the mosaic uh, building. Extremely simple brick building, relatively big windows and there's only a staircase at this end and then one on the, at the other side and they give access the staircases to these um, to these corridors built in wood just this duality of the brick facade and the wooden facade um, and then of course it comes to architecture how it is made no wood needs a certain protection it needs a roof the columns, the, how they are made, so the edges are slightly um, uh, cut out from here to here, so they need a kind of an interpretation of a, of a, um, of a capital and so um, A very beautiful building and then of course how it is um, used, these balconies, which should just give access to the apartments, but they are pri privatized, this is a question. Uh, 
is interesting. It shows us a lot about the quality um, and obviously uh, people are very happy to have this, this uh, usable balconies. And this is the, um, the famous example of the tram workers' um, houses. Uh, some of them are badly restored. There are some which are still um, kind of very historical with the, with the open balconies. Again, you know, the balcony um, is, a, is a big question. Uh, climate change will change the way how we use uh, ex um, exterior spaces and the, how we protect the building from the heat. And of course, this example is also very interesting as it is a communal building, communal kitchen, communal bus, um, which was a socialist idea at the time. But if you would ask um, uh, one of our students what the ideal of housing would be, for sure 90% would say a common way of living. Eh? Give up the kind of the small apartment of the so-called typical family. Let's kind of share. And um, in Switzerland, or I would say in Europe, Western Europe, this is a huge question how um, sharing could add uh, new qualities to life and to living. So, um, I should accelerate a little bit. This was how the typology is um, um, uh, related to the city. Um, survival of the fittest, as I said, it's about the evolution of types. Aldo Rossi used a type. I don't know if you know Aldo Rossi's work and his writings. Somehow talking about the type, you would always uh, ask, um, is it related to Aldo Rossi? And uh, I think in our case, we see it a bit differently. In Aldo Rossi, type is something dead, like a skeleton of a building. It's a cause of an ossification of the structure. It's dead and it lasts forever. And uh, what we found out is how that the type is never fixed. Eh? The type is always moving, is developing. Um, for instance, this is uh, Buenos Aires. This, you see the typical plot um, in the South American colonial cities, 120 by 120 meters, originally meant for four big courtyards, one-story houses, very generous. But then this densification, these parcels were getting smaller and smaller, and they were getting slimmer, but not necessarily less deep, because here, if every building has to touch the street, you would eventually have a, a depth of 60 meters, and then a law redu um, limited the reduction to 8.3 meters. So um, you have plots 60 meters deep, 8 meters wide, which creates a problem. And, um, uh, and it's interesting how, um, how people dealt with it. Huh? Originally, you have these small types. Originally, it was kind of yeah. a big courtyard, but then with a small building, you have a very small courtyard. So um, you might have uh, a house called Chorizo because it's so linear. It doesn't kind of go around the courtyard. It's just a kind of one-sided house. Another house, they share a courtyard. Or then it gets more extreme because the house gets so long, you put houses behind each other, even with staircases or you start to have houses behind each other with courtyards in between. And from this corridor that goes to these houses, slight, slowly, slowly, um, something new develops, which is um, this, is this uh, type, which is a passage. No? So this kind of inner um, corridor turns into a kind of a small uh, public open space and even further, it develops in a real street. So if you pass by the situation, you would say this is just a normal street, and then you see that the facades are identical. And in the map you see, it's, out, it's not belonging to the system of the streets. It's a private street, which enables um, these buildings to have windows to this inner street. So this is a, is a solution of a problem. Um, and you can see that uh, gradually architecture is adapting to the changes. So you could say a type is always, always in crisis because a type is a solution in a certain moment, but time goes on, people are changing, demography is changing, economy is changing, climate is changing. So what was designed from the time that it is built on, it's always in a crisis. And, um, 
And uh, we found this an extremely um, important uh, discovery um, that the type is not something given all forever, but always just a kind of a scheme that is there and that we can take and develop further. So um, as it is a bit late, I, I jump over. Um, this is one of these uh, passage types um, in Buenos Aires. Um, maybe I jump over Paris um, to get um, to, um, to some uh, projects we did um, or we are doing in, in our office. So I skipped Paris. But we did a project in Paris which is obviously related to what we found in Paris. Paris, what do you have in a, uh, as an image in your head? Is this kind of straight streets with a repetition of windows. One house differs very little from the next one. A homogeneity of architecture, the French window, the vertical window. And when we did this competition for social housing, we said, you know, maybe this is the advantage if you are Swiss, you come from outside to Paris. That's what we like in Paris. The repetition of these windows um, and, um, and the continuity of this building along the street. But we found, I skipped it, but we found examples, of course, in 19th century, the facades were straight. In 20th century, architects start to break up the facades, still accepting the street as a public space, buildings um, having to create this space, um, kind of not understanding architecture as object, but as space building um, uh, facades. Um, but there were kind of setbacks, um, bay windows which are interacting with the street. And we developed this very kind of um, repetitive system um, I don't know if it's monotonous, maybe not because it has this, it introduces this rhythm, but still I think um, it is very quiet and um, we believe, I was talking about star architecture, you know, we believe that um, to integrate a building in the city, it, always, it also has to be able to take itself a bit back. Huh? It shouldn't be there as an object, but it should be able to communicate with the neighbor. If I go back, huh? of course we couldn't build in natural stone. It is social housing, extremely cheaply built. But we took a kind of a metal sheet facade, which is somehow familiar or close to the colors of these traditional metal sheet roofs that you could see in Paris. Um, but it takes over the window, it takes over the metal, uh, the simple metal uh, uh, railing, um, and um, and at the end, it's a typology. You no, know? it's a typology of the of um, of a building following the street, but it has some special features. For instance, the street makes this S shape curve, and just this um, given quality of the street makes this house unique. So it's unique at the same time. It is um, referring very much to the, to the traditional uh, houses, mainly from 19th century in, in, um, in Paris. And then in the, in, inside the apartments, we, um, we uh, were experiencing the quality of these 19th century floor plans, now where you would go from one space to the next one. So from a, from a corridor to the living room to the lodger. And, uh, that's basically what this floor plan does. Huh? You have a lodger living, um, uh, a bedroom and a lodger. So you can see through the building, even the spaces are small as it's social houses, but it gives a certain generosity just by applying this 19th century scheme of the enfilade. Huh? And of course these cut cutouts, they create special additional possibilities to, um, to bring light into, into the apartments. This was our very first building. It is, um, it is situated in one of the richest um, um, uh, suburbs of, of Zurich. And we really didn't feel like building a villa. No? And it was a kind of a bit, you can see, you know, mirroring the, the railway um, 
uh, and this is somehow the style around. So um, we um, thought we relate this building not to the villas around, not to the context. This is not our typology. Our typology is the one of the railway. Yeah? Industrial buildings along the railway, and we say yeah, it's housing, but we do, we build a workshop house. This was our, we did it 25 years ago, and it was also a bit of protest against this posh kind of um, villa um, <laughs> neighborhood. So we said it's gray, huh? it's boring. Um, uh, we don't even provide a garden, we just give the house a staircase and then you can go down to this kind of industrial space. You can put your table there and your plants, meanwhile it is uh, actively used. Um, but we liked this, 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 um, this a bit sad uh, character of the industrial building and also inside. We, um, we use the features of industrial buildings, horizontal windows, concrete prefab columns or things like that, and industrial flooring and these, um, these, um, these elements that give life to the depths. And in the typology, it is referring to, to, um, to a kind of um, yeah, workshop building, of course, then built-in um, bathroom, but it is a repetitive structure. And uh, it somehow it pretends to have been one house that was uh, pretend, um, extended later. So, um, what we um, what we did here is that we invented a scenario, an image, no, a kind of an atmosphere, how to build at the at the at the, at the railway, and out of the scenario, from the scenario, you from these these uh, images you define the type, the typology, the typology of the of a simple repetitive structure of a warehouse. So the type is related to an atmosphere, also to a character of a space, to formal decisions of the facade, um, and so on. Um, this is another very typological project um, standing at the, at the, at the train. Uh, with very high uh, noise, uh, which is in Switzerland a huge problem. You cannot really build along uh, highways or um, railway tracks. So the building had to be kind of oriented away from, from, uh, from the railway. And uh, it, is a, it takes all its, its power, all its architectonical um, uh, qualities from this problem. So it has these two sides, one to the railway, one to the south, to the, um, to the, uh, to the side, um, to the opposite side. And um, of course, this floor plan is just a solution to the problem, how to uh, give access to each apartment to this um, more quiet um, uh, side. So this is somehow related to Hong Kong. No? You have a problem and the rules, the regulations, the noise makes your architecture. And I think um, the, the clarity of, of the design is, is, um, is clearly due to, uh, to, this, um, um, to this accepting the problem as a design provoking or design generating feature. This is an office building, um, which is a very normal office building, but it has this sockel because there is um, a missing space around the building and on the opposite side that I don't show you, um, this kind of cantilever creates a waiting zone for the bus stop. Um, but it, at the same time, it's very normal. So again, no? it's um, a very normal typology, open space, columns, repetitive facade, a core in the middle, but what is specific is just the side, mm -hmm. the geometry of the side plus this sockel um, um, that creates these, these zones around it. Another very typical um, generic office building that we built in Basel for Roche, where we, we um, accepted the repetitive character of the horizontal window as a feature in, in, in offices and the calls inside. And the only invention we did is, well, you see the ribbons are getting heavier 
So repetition is, um, is a kind of um, celebrated. And what we did as an invention is that we, um, we gave on the entrance facade, we put the facade back and we created a kind of lodger. No? We said, why should you only have lodgers in housing? Why, while working, you shouldn't sit outside with your laptop or go um, doing a phone call or even a meeting. We provide um, open space. And um, in terms of architecture, it was very interesting as the building is so simple, just these horizontal slabs, um, these uh, ribbons, these concrete, white concrete ribbons, um, there where you have the lodge, the house is so, so archaic, and it's so primitive, it's so simple, it's just um, the structure, and it doesn't even have a facade, and that's the space how it is provided uh, before people took it, uh, uh, appropriated it. And this is the inside, and this is the look from inside to, the, uh, to this lodger. Um, maybe I jump over this. This is a smaller industrial building uh, on a very difficult, uh, difficult. Uh, the shape of the of the plot was very difficult, and there is a slope, so it has um, two diff very different sides. This is the entrance facade, and this is the opposite facade with this base for the for the machines. Um, and uh, that's what comes out because um, um, you've seen these two facades, huh? entrance facade and this, this facade. By um, uh, inventing this fan facade, a fan structure which deals with, uh, with, the, with the site and, um, and uh, negotiates between the two different um, uh, levels in the, of the tele. <coughs> this is not a very typological project. Um, this is a small pavilion in a garden of a villa. So the, the old owner of the villa um, wanted to hand over the villa to the, to, this, um, to the young family with their children. And he, um, so we built this small pavilion for this old uh, um, uh, owner. Um, and um, of course, you, with a pavilion in a garden, you could say this is the, the most free task that you can get, you know. You ha don't have any financial restrictions, no building regulations because it is so small, there is space enough, um, uh, structural problems are not really relevant because it's so small, so you could do whatever. Huh? And, um, and towards this freedom, we <laughs> We reacted with somehow with the opposite. We did the most stubborn, most typological one, could say, eh? most rigid project that you could think of. Three identical windows. Then we had the problem: what do we do with the door? So um, we we have we hided the door. We cladded it in this um, asphalt. How do you call it? asphalt uh, sheets eh? that you normally use for um, for for roofing? We even cladded the, the shutters in the same material. Um, so it's typological, the structure of the windows. And of course, um, then you have to decide how you do the material, how to, um, how to do a roof to protect the, um, the door. And when we do discuss about these questions, we always consider how, with the materiality, we could strengthen the primary character um, of, of the type. And uh, of course, this kind of very, um, very cheap material somehow is in a contrast to these, uh, to these big windows. It's a relatively high space. Um, so it is um, maybe a, also an expression that it is. It, it's an easy wooden construction, it's a timber construction. So um, uh, the material is also an expression of, of this, of this uh, constructive reality. And that is the beauty of the closed facade. Um, and the inside, an industrial concrete floor and then um, a wooden, wooden cladding painted, but painted in a very bourgeois dark color. So the dark color contrasts with the, with the light from the windows. So, 
And as the darker facade is the most more prominent uh, window to show. So in the inside, about celebrating the rhythm of these windows. Then there is a bathroom, entrance, kitchen, and two identical um, rooms, and um, and some uh, uh, complicated doors that you could uh, completely open and hide the kitchen and the uh, and the and the bathroom, and then you have kind of one open, uh, one could say, a modern space with a with a box in the middle. This is uh, maybe our most uh, important project, um, not because it's uh, big and prominent and well known, but maybe because we, we could somehow express ourselves and our interests um, in typology the, the, in the clearest way. This is the Kunstmuseum in Basel, uh, which is a 19, uh, 1936 uh, building, beautiful building with a courtyard in natural stone, and this was the extension to it. So the problem was there is a street in between, so you couldn't physically connect them, but how are they connected? And, um, and uh, we uh, developed um, an architecture which is able to build up this dialogue, to say clearly, I'm, yes, this is the, <laughs> I should stop. <laughs> um, an architecture that uh, builds up a relationship. I'm the extension, I belong to you, that people would understand uh, intu intuitively that these buildings belong together. At the same time, of course, it's a contemporary version of it. Uh, and you can see the plot, the ancient plot was much bigger, and here we have a complex geometry. It's a medieval part of the city. Um, so we had to make the best use from this, from this plot. And um, what we said, you know, this is a monument. Yeah? There are also further monuments built in the 19th century when the fortification of the medieval city were torn down. Whereas this one is much more um, related to bourgeois and uh, medieval houses here. So we said it has a bit of both now. Of course, it is a monument. Um, but at the same time, it has to be able to relate to this context. And, um, and somehow what we did typologically, we built, um, I hoped for the floor plan, it will come later. So we built two houses, two rectangular houses standing at the street, at this street, at this street, and the kind of um, fill in which takes uh, the staircases and all the technical necessities of fire escape uh, door, um, staircases and, um, and elevators and uh, technical installations and so on. And, um, and this is the building which is somehow just um, an extrusion of the plot, not perfectly, so this kind of um, uh, uh, concave uh, uh, gesture is an invention, is a gesture to create an entrance. We didn't make a kind of a huge um, open entrance as other offices would do. Say, yeah, I'm, I'm public, everybody's welcome. Of course everybody's welcome, but we think that also a, a kind of a, a door in a wall is something beautiful and a closed wall is something beautiful and this house stands here at the street with a lot of traffic. It needs a certain massivity also to, to, uh, um, to be um, strong enough against uh, the traffic. And this is the backside. Huh? It's also the love for the brick. There are windows, but on the top floor you have the light, the skylight, so you don't need much windows or no windows at all. So it's a lot about celebrating the brick, which is a consequence of uh, the typological organization uh, of it. So um, this is the normal floor plan of the first floor with the windows. So it's basically a very traditional um, floor plan, no? a room with a window. Um, so we've been in Rustavi today with this beautiful um, housing from the 1940s. Well-proportioned spaces, a door to the next space, a window. It's about the physical quality, about the dimension, about the materiality, about the garden, of course. So 
this house wants somehow to, um, to be a very uh, traditional house. At the same time, of course, it's a very modern house. It's a high-tech house. A museum has to provide security, um, the climate, and so on. And at the same time, the traditional window is also able to establish the contact, the visual contact to the existing building, to the old building, which has a similar typology of windows and also a kind of a celebration of the materiality. So it's a grey brick and the whitish, uh, greyish um, uh, stone that start to speak to each other. And then the result of this distorted geometry is this expressive, I would call it kind of industrial staircase that looks like kind of elevators um, which uh, uh, creates the dynamic to, to push you up. Um, and um, this brings me to a very short last chapter, uh, which is about teaching. Um, uh, so when we do architecture, we try to relate our projects to types. So to something which was developed by people before us in the last centuries. We take this knowledge, we take this existing architecture, we transform it, we comment it, we develop it further with the constraints of today, with the technology of today, with the questions of today, the requirements of today, with social ideas of today. I think we have to be radically modern but that doesn't mean that we have to make inventions. I think there are no inventions in architecture, but there is an enormous rich fundus of, in architectural history, which is available, which we can use, and which we should use. And the same way we make architecture in our um, studio, we teach our students. So we go to a city, for instance. Here we went to Milano. This semester we went to Torino. So we start the semester looking at architecture. Looking what is there and trying to look at it. This uh, was during Corona, we couldn't, COVID crisis, we couldn't go to Italy. So we went to, to Switzerland itself. This was a semester um, dealing about the storage. So students went out, went uh, in the, looking for storage buildings all over Switzerland. For instance, in the Alps, where we would store uh, hay and, um, and, uh, and cheese and, 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 the, and the cows. I don't know if this is a stable or... But, um, uh, so also historic, very historic um, traditional examples, but also very technical examples, like this uh, grain silo in Basel and the harbor in Basel. And we make the students draw them. The first thing is just draw them, take beautiful photos, draw them very precisely. And, um, and we are really cruel now. We force them to go into detail. But it is so important, the drawing is not just a form of representation, it is a form of thinking. No? If you draw it, you look at it precisely. Um, so this is the first step understanding architecture by looking at it, by drawing it, and then, of course, trying to explain what I see. What is the characteristic of this building? What is its type? Eh? What makes this building um, typical? What is relevant and what is not relevant? What is unique? Or what is also a feature that is um, typical for such a silo and is um, appearing in other silos too? So we make them also um, design draw details to understand really how it's physically built. This was the semester in uh, Milano. Um, this is the Biennale building in, in Milano. And then at the end of the semester, we have a kind of a typology. So this is the storage typology, different storage buildings from very from medieval grain silos in the Alps to huge factories. Um, this is a um, is a, a ditch, a water, a power, a hydro power station. Yeah. It's all forms of architecture that contain something, a liquid, um, some food, objects, or whatever. And this is then a, a close-up of, of these beautiful drawings, which are at the end of this first phase of looking at architecture and trying to organize it following certain rules and to understand them 
structurally or formally or functionally building groups and building this typology. And then out of this question, we say, we, uh, we, we talk about pro projects, no? we talk about these houses as they were projects, our projects. No? When you look at the building, it starts to be your project. No? And by describing it, we think that this is, uh, by just be describing it, a uh, first idea of a project of changing would come in. So these two students, they, um, they described one of these uh, 60s uh, curtain wall buildings and in the 60s the dimensions were so small, huh? the buildings were somehow too small. And, and these facades, you know, closed facades, it's somehow you always, you cannot open the window. Huh? And just by describing this, all of a sudden you come to why, why don't we extend it? Why don't you provide a space where you could finally open the window and go out? So they invented this tower, which is kind of just a greenhouse that in each story you just can go out and have your garden. Huh? So by describing architecture, by describing the type, you also start to, to kind of uh, uh, thinking a possible development. That's what we find basic in, in the type. And this is example by Chiara, who um, studied uh, also kind of a uh, um, 1970s facade where you cannot open the, uh, the window. And by just describing it, why not opening the window? Couldn't we use these panels and, um, and, uh, and, and using them um, as kind of shutters? This is just a very beautiful building uh, drawing of, of students who were um, finding a, um, describing a project which had this kind of uh, composition of building, building uh, parts on top of each other. Um, and then with this material, with this, uh, with this uh, catalog of elements, of structures, um, of, of volumes, of compositional elements, with these typologies, we then go into the second semester, which we call real architecture, where students ask what is um, the challenges of our time. So in the storage semester, it was obvious, what do we have to store? Energy is a huge issue. We have energy peaks. Um, if we have wind craft, wind uh, power stations would produce energy, but uh, maybe the peaks of uh, consumption wouldn't coincide with the peaks of uh, production. So we need um, batteries. Huh? So they, they, they developed a, a housing put on top of a battery, but the housing itself looks like a battery. Huh? So um, we force the students to develop very contemporary questions which were about storing. This is an ancient kind of a silver mine, which they said could be used as a, as a storage um, uh, for, uh, for um, uh, a server, for servers. And at the same time, the, the heat produced by the servers could be used for bathing, uh, for the thermal baths. So it's very contemporary questions, how to deal with the energy consumption and the heat of a server but then applying traditional elements we found, traditional structures that we found, um, uh, and that's how they developed the project. This is using uh, this, the, the lake, the, the water of the lake to cool cheese, very Swiss project, so this is, that's why I bring it as a last one. Uh, and then we, we forced them to, to build these beautiful models where they reuse found elements this is used, this is found, for instance, these uh, trusses are found in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a storage building in Switzerland and reused, reapplied in a, in a new uh, uh, composition of architecture. So thanks for your patience and um, I'm happy to discuss for the questions. Do you have some questions? Is it okay? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll be, we'll be happy, yes. Thank you. Um, uh, is there some questions? To help it a bit out? We have two microphones at the back. Okay, I see many hands. <laughs> um, so here one question and then the other one. I think uh, oh. the uh, key 
key to the typology uh, conversation are those attributes according to which those types are created, right? So sometimes we talk about typology according to scale, sometimes we talk about typology according to program, etc. So what are uh, some of the most out outstanding types that you encountered in some of the cities that you've been researching? And what uh, what is this sort of, what are the attributes of some of the types that you've already encountered in UDC that are maybe more or less unique yeah. to other well, the second question is a difficult one, <laughs> because you are all experts in Tbilisi and we are kind of beginners. So, um, But maybe to the, the first one is an interesting one. We understand um, the, the, the criteria, the typological criteria that we apply is, uh, is normally not the program. Of course, I'm not very precise. I was talking about these industrial buildings in Hong Kong. Huh? So industrial is, is a kind of a use, but um, uh, we rather understand it, uh, the type as a structural um, organizational system, no? how, how a floor plate would be organized. Huh? So the, this, these industrial buildings, they would have huge floor plates and the staircases put aside that they didn't, wouldn't disturb. Huh? Whereas housing, of course, has the staircases um, more centrally to be able to distribute um, uh, or to access different houses. So um, uh, we are mainly talking about the structure. Which also brings me to, uh, to uh, of course, then the question uh, that the type, because we, we are not so, um, we do not relate it basically to the program, that the type could also be in a certain way, more or less, independent from function. So I showed our first house at the railway, no? <laughs> um, which somehow pretended to be a kind of a reuse of uh, industrial structure. Um, and there comes in a very important issue. I wasn't talking about, um, about uh, sustainability, but for instance in Switzerland, now buildings from the 1990s are being destroyed. They are more or less, you know, Switzerland by builds very perfectly expensive, so they are new, right? but they are being destroyed because um, the, the way they are or typologically organized is not so interesting anymore. Right? So, office buildings where the floor height is not big enough or um, the staircases wouldn't allow uh, certain flexibility. And this is absurd, no? Ecologically, this is criminal, no? And, um, and which brings me to the question, could we, um, when we design, huh, in how far can we develop types which are a bit more open to, to, the, to the program, uh, which would allow maybe a reuse. Now we are in one of the most beautiful uh, examples of reuse here. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to be honest, it's, uh, it has a lot to do be, uh, with, with just uh, with the de dimension. Uh. The bigger, the more generous you plan, the easier it is to, to, to reuse. So, but also the type, of course, the more generic it is, um, the easier mm -hmm. it might be to, to reuse. Um, and the, the most, the most uh, ex extreme examples, there are lots, uh, well, of course, these pencil towers are just extreme uh, in, the, in the verticality. Um, we found, for instance, in, in Delhi, in New Delhi, you have beautiful, completely, nearly psychedelic uh, constellations of housing, three, four stories high of of kind of modules which are turned and assembled in a new way from floor to floor. It's like, I, I don't know, it's a bit superficial, but Indian culture has a certain affinity to mathematics, obviously. And it's about combining them. It's nearly impossible to understand it. And they were part of a, of a public um, uh, housing program after the independence. So the, this independence brought an enormous enthusiasm, young uh, architects, engineers, pushing the, the country forward and the kind of social, socialist, social idea of, um, of, of creating this new India. And this, they are fantastic. Huh? You're there in a, and they're so intimate and somehow very traditional because they have a small scale of the cells. At the same time, they're relatively big developments care, uh, related to a social idea of, of, of a new state. Um, well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask 
No, sorry, you were. <laughs> talk uh, about the relationship between uh, types and the concept in our practice. And can types become a concept? And can the concept ignore the type? And generally, what is the, uh, when you begin working on the project, yes. how important component to have the type behind? What, what is a concept, no? I mean, when we were studying as, as students, everybody was talking about concepts, no? and um, uh, and uh, what was it? Um, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I was, I was, because Emmanuel, my partner, no, once told the story, I think it was uh, Briggs who um, explained the project by Cope Hildenblau by a kind of uh, a Coca Cola can that was kind of distorted, and uh, he said, This is our concept, that's why we built the house. No? And this is somehow what we find extremely problematic to, um, uh, to start with a problematic un understanding of this term. If a concept is a very individual explanation why I do something, but this is my understanding of architecture, it's my project, and I do it like this, take it or, um, yeah, or leave it. So, um, so understanding concept in this way, I could say type is a kind of a opposite understanding because it relates my idea to a kind of a shared knowledge and culture of, of, uh, of architecture. But maybe you understood it, uh, or you understand the term differently? Uh, so oh. the main question was that if, yeah. if But of course, a, a project needs an idea. No? Um, it needs an understanding of, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah. you, take, you have to take a position, and you have to know why you take a position. If a client asks for something, you have to take a position, how you understand the program, how you read the site. Um, and taking a position is developing ideas, eh? De developing a, a narrative. And, and using the type is, is um, the type is then kind of a tool to um, to uh, to realize to find a form for uh, for your understanding of, of the site and of a task. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Maybe or comments? Ah. Ah, who was first? Thank you for this terrific presentation. I will just read my question. It's, it's uh, while uh, talking about so while talking about typological analysis, we of course talk about the formal analysis of the building. Uh, formal analysis itself can be divided into many sections, but uh, what uh, you showed us mostly was about uh, physical formal analysis of the buildings that you, you showed us. But also there is a formal analysis regarding the spirit of the space, and I was wondering if you also apply this kind of analysis in your studio uh, and in your practice. The spirit of the space? Yes. Spirit of the space. Uh, Yes, of course. Yeah, I didn't talk a lot about the space, you're right. <laughs> no, but of course, you know, the space, this is our, that's what we, what is the specificity of our profession that we create spaces. And I was talking a lot about floor plans. Um, there are also buildings where you need a section, but of course this floor plan is crucial um, how a space is organized, no? uh, um, how a space is separated from the next space or is related to the next space, how it relates. Um, and uh, the way spaces are organized in a floor plan, they tell you as a user, huh, they, in, they give you the possibility to move or they, they encourage you to move or they discourage you to move. Um, so it's, of course, organizing space, typology is an is a organization of spaces. Huh? Um, and, uh, and therefore, uh, the character of a space is, as Scorpius says, no? everything is gross in the, in the floor plan. Thank you. Okay, so there was Jesse, one of the 
Sorry, I don't know if I understood it correctly. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mention, you mean the size? The size? Yeah, yeah, the, the size. The size, the size. The size. Yeah. yeah. Dimensions, right? Like how many millimeters? You're, you're very precise at certain moments mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. point that uh, you know, sort of takes on more than just a basic sort of capacity. Mm -hmm. And like, what, what does it sort of become a typological either friction point or leverage point? Yeah. I mean, well. It was revealing today in Ostawi, no? we saw this 1940s planning. No? Housing with spaces, 18 square meters big, three meter 20 high. And yesterday in Kdani, it was two meter 40, and the spaces are 11 square meters, no? Probably, we didn't really enter, but we saw it from the floor plans, and you can feel it, you know? You look at the facade, and the facade tells you about the dimension of a space. Because you can feel not the height of a parapet, you can feel how a window sits in the facade, and this gives a completely different expression. And uh, I mean, I think we, um, of course, we are, we are um, optical beings, and the expression of a building affects your physical reaction to it. A building which has a certain dimension <laughs> is just much more physically inviting than uh, this kind of squeeze, squeezing in. And yeah, you look at the facade, and the, the kind of the, the building already tells you how you would feel inside the space. Yeah? So the dimension is, uh, is a basic uh, physical um, de yeah, defines basically how. The body, the human body, is related to a to a space. Yeah. Is it a typological point of view? Ever though, like I guess the the the, the, the size. The size, of, the size of yeah. The yes, of course, size. of course. You cannot you cannot scale down the floor plan. No? It doesn't work anymore because a staircase a step is a step. You cannot just scale it. No, if you scale up the house, it needs more staircases. So the the floor plan starts to um, to uh, to change. That's why we, uh, we are really strict with our students. No? We work in fixed scales, no? 1 to 200, 1 to 100, 1 to 50. You cannot use a scale in between because then you lose the control about the absolute spaces. No, no you cannot scale a type. A type has, is, is related to a certain dimension. No? Yeah. Maybe one final question. Um, you
Yeah. I mean, I find this an extremely interesting but also extremely difficult question. And um, I'm sorry I wouldn't answer it because I think um, these are really sensitive uh, questions and I just can say how it shouldn't be done, no? Uh, or, um, for instance, uh, you know, Italian fascism was never really discussed. And Fendi, uh, the fashion label Fendi, they just find this kind of, you know, this, um, this Colosseo Quadrato, this uh, in, the, in Rome, uh, this Mussolini cube, it's one of the most iconic fascist buildings. Uh, and they just find it cool because it's a nice material and the shadow and the light, it's so modern. And so, you know, this is a way you cannot do it. No? I don't say it, it cannot be used as an office building, but the way we talk about it, I think in these sensitive problems, you know, the longer, the older I get, these sensitive problems, I think we have to ask questions and we can discuss, but to give answers is difficult. But I think we should ask questions and, um, and uh, avoid doing kind of um, yeah, shortcut, uh, shortcut decisions. I think, um, yeah, it, uh, it's also very difficult. What is a fascist building? No? Is a, we were in Turin or in Torino this semester, I didn't show you, and there's a lot of, lot of houses from the fascist area. Huh? era. Um, are they fascist? No? Some are fascist because they express a kind of uh, understanding of, um, of living and uh, they kind of really um, cultivate um, an ideology and they express it. You can, you can discuss it, but what would you do with this building? Would you destroy it? <laughs> I, I don't know it. I think we just, uh, we should, as we are an open society, we should keep discussing um, and avoid and the kind of um, be critical towards opinions which are too, too decided. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we should for sure keep discussing uh, about architecture and the buildings. Um, and um, I would really like to thank you for today's talk. And uh, also use the opportunity to say that tomorrow we will host another uh, really interesting talk by Jean-Philippe Vassal. Um, it will take place at TBC concert, so um, please join us there as well. And um, yeah, thank you so much. And um, we are really looking forward to what you will, um, your uh, result of your study trip will be here. And um, then uh, the typology, like um, these uh, applications that you make, mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to see about Belisi as well. So thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Danke <laughs> euch. Danke vielmals. Ja.